Hello everyone, and thank you for joining today for this presentation regarding ICPMS Tips and Tricks. My hope is that you will find at least one item that you can utilize in your lab to help you produce better quality data. Our agenda for this talk includes looking more in-depth potential issues with your sample introduction system, as most issues occur here. Delving a bit deeper into a few analytical tips I have utilized over the years that have helped me in the lab. Things like total quant analysis for screening purposes, EDR or extended dynamic range, or parameters to monitor in your analysis, as well as a few others. We'll also discuss a few software tricks that you can use that you may have forgotten or just don't use that often. As most of you who are attending this talk know, a lot of things can go wrong along the way. The key message that I'd like to communicate to you today is that 95% or more of the things that can go wrong, leading to problems with your results, are typically sample introduction related. By sample introduction, I mean everything that happens before the sample actually makes it into the plasma. This could be old, worn, or improperly tensioned pump tubing causing erratic delivery of your sample to the plasma. And I would mention that you need to make sure that you, for every eight hours of use, you're replacing your pump tubing. Clogged or partially clogged nebulizers delivering non-ideal sample aerosol to the plasma can cause problems. Flooding your spray chamber or torch by having worn out drain tubing or having it hooked up incorrectly, in some cases even backwards, so you end up pumping your waste container into the spray chamber, can also cause your torch to flood and the plasma to extinguish. Other common issues are having leaks or air bubbles in the lines that cause signal instability and spiking, delivering too much or too little sample to the plasma, or having your sample uptake and read delay time set incorrectly, so you start acquiring data before the sample is even in the plasma or before the signal in the plasma is stabilized. I see this lots of times when a T is used when you add your internal standard, so just be aware. Most of us don't even notice we have a problem until the QC check sample and an analysis fails. My purpose today is to teach you where to look when something like that does happen, and the place to start is sample introduction system, always. A critical part of your sample introduction system is your nebulizer. It is extremely important to be aware of how to test a nebulizer to see if it's working properly. A concentric nebulizer should self-aspirate or produce an aerosol by pulling liquid into the sample line without pumping once the nebulizer gas is turned on. If they do not self-aspirate, you should suspect a damaged or plugged nebulizer. If you examine the aerosol produced by the nebulizer, it should be uniform with fine particles. If you see spitting or large droplets or the aerosol shooting off to one side, the nebulizer is probably partially plugged. Test a nebulizer, remove it from the spray chamber, put the sample tubing that connects to the peristaltic pump in a container of DI water. Manually turn on the nebulizer gas using the system tools, nebulizer and torch gas test tool, and the Synjustic software. Observe the aerosol around a black background. Become familiar with what is normal for your nebulizer. If the aerosol doesn't look normal, you need to perform some maintenance. The best approach is to prevent your nebulizer from getting clogged in the first place. The simple thing to do here is make sure you rinse it with a clean acid blank solution after the last sample for 10 to 15 minutes. This is best done with the plasma still on and you will also be rinsing the spray chamber as well. This will prevent salts from building up in the spray chamber as well as depositing on your nebulizer after the instrument is shut down. You must use an appropriate cleaning procedure for your particular nebulizer. Please consult the manufacturer for detailed procedures. I've included a few relevant links to the commonly used nebulizer maintenance pages. One key thing to remember is to never sonicate a quartz or glass nebulizer unless you want to be buying a new one, because sonication will destroy it. 
You can also use a back flush device. Just make sure it is appropriate for your particular nebulizer. You can also soak the nebulizer in a special cleaning solution, such as RBS 25, which is recommended by some nebulizer manufacturers. And finally, always have a spare nebulizer. You aren't going to be able to run any samples until you get a new one. I recommend to customers to always have a spare, just in case. Now I would like to move on to a few tips I have learned over the years. Whether you're using an older ICPMS or a newer one, I hope there is something in these next two sections that you can take away that will help you in your lab. One of the many options that our ICPMS systems have had for many years is the capability to do a total quant or a semi-quant scan across the full mass range. This is a feature that I feel many labs overlook in their day-to-day -day analysis. Total quant is a great way to get a snapshot of an unknown sample or to confirm an issue you are seeing with a particular sample or matrix. It can also be used to confirm quantitative results, determine the correct dilutions prior to a quantitative analysis, or just provide quick ballpark results for all elements. There are two methods provided for you in your Synergistic software that make it really easy to run the analysis in just a few minutes. Another great feature of our ICPMS systems is the capability of the universal cell to utilize EDR or extended dynamic range. This capability enables the analyst to use the quadrupole inside the universal cell to detune sensitivity on specific high concentration elements so that they can be analyzed together with the very low concentration elements to extend the dynamic range of the detector to over nine orders of magnitude. EDR can be included in a multi-mode method with either an Elan DRC or a Nexian ICPMS system. Once you know your sample matrices, this can be fine-tuned in your method and can offer a dramatic boost in productivity. Utilizing EDR mode can help in eliminating the need to rerun samples that are at high concentrations like sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium, while needing low detection limits for elements like arsenic, selenium, cadmium, and lead. Many labs are trying to produce numbers that would typically be analyzed by ICP OES for minerals, but can do so with this unique feature. Reruns can be minimized when methods utilize EDR. Many methods I create can have minerals measured with and without EDR, saving time, money, and no increase in analysis time. The table on the right of this slide shows the equivalent electronic dilution achieved with increasing electronic settings on the universal cell quadrupole setting rejection parameter A. You can run elements with multiple EDR settings to aid during testing and method development or to cover all the concentration ranges of your samples. The RPA or high mass cutoff setting on the universal cell is increased slightly. Voltages of 0 0.008 to 0 0.016 are suggested starting points to detune the ion beam as it passes through the cell. The graph shows the resulting peak height by applying EDR an equivalent 1 to 10 dilution of only sodium in this sample. Method clip in the bottom section shows how this is set up within a method. Elements in both normal and EDR mode can be calibrated at the same time, leading to extended dynamic range in the hundreds of ppm. Many labs analyzing arsenic and selenium for PA method 200.8 and have issues when their krypton levels become elevated within their argon plasma gas. Depending on the type of argon tank and where it is located, customers can see these levels change throughout the day. If your argon tank is getting lower, the krypton will become more concentrated within the tank, and you can have issues meeting lower limits of detection due to this. If you monitor your krypton at masses 83 and 84, you will be able to see this could be causing analysis issues. This way you can try to stay ahead of any failed QCs for arsenic and selenium that may appear due to elevated levels of krypton. This may mean getting a new tank of argon or having help from your gas vendor. 
typically vendors are not testing for Krypton, so may not be aware until you have told them that this is an issue. Another approach for labs analyzing EPA method 200.8, achieve lower detection limits needed for arsenic and selenium, is the addition of organics. In the presence of a small amount of organic, the ionization equilibrium within the plasma for these higher ionization potential elements can provide signal enhancement. Many labs may add a small amount of methanol or isopropanol to their internal standard mix to help provide this improvement to their signal. The paper shown here discusses the causes and extent of those enhancement investigations. EA, ICP OES, and ICP MS are all comparative techniques. If you have a bad calibration blank, meaning it is contaminated, you will have bad calibration and bad data. Know what is normal for the elements you are analyzing. Always look at the raw intensity data. You should also have a feel for all the matrices you will be analyzing. Calibration solutions of 1% or 2% nitric, a mix of nitric and HCO, or even something a bit more far-fetched like I have analyzed in the past with perchloric, HF, and boric. Once you have a feel for these levels, if you see much higher, you will be able to backtrack and determine where the elevation may be coming from. No problem has ever been solved by looking at just the concentration data. A large number of ICPMS users are running samples according to EPA method 200.8, or they use this method as a starting point because it is well known and documented. How many of you are just calibrating for the trace elements and not including the major elements in your calibration? because typically you're reporting these by ICP OAS. The problem is that every natural water has minerals, sodium, calcium, magnesium, and potassium present in significant PPM levels. Sodium and potassium are easily ionized elements. Calcium causes AIR effects, affecting speed of desolvation and vaporization of droplets. If you have issues keeping QCs or other check standards in that have levels of the major cations present, then you have some EIE effects occurring. Let's look closer at this calibration plot for zinc in standard mode. Blue points are calibration up to 200 PV with no matrix, just the analytes of interest. Red dots are the calibration when calcium, sodium, magnesium, and potassium, as well as silicon, are added at increasing levels to the top three standards. Basically, when 25 to 50 ppm of calcium and sodium and 5 to 10 ppm of magnesium, potassium, and silicon are added, the slope of the zinc calibration is suppressed by 23%. In addition, the different internal standards are suppressed by different amounts. 31% for rhodium, 6% for iridium, and 16% for germanium. So picking an internal standard can be critical in this case. It won't fix everything. A similar effect occurs in KED mode. Look at this calibration plot for zinc in KED mode with helium cell gas. Blue points are the calibration up to 200 PB with no matrix, just the analyte of interest. Red dots are the calibration when calcium, sodium, magnesium, potassium, and silicon are added to the top three standards. Basically, when 25 to 50 ppm of calcium and sodium and 5 to 10 ppm of magnesium, potassium, and silicon are added, the slope of the zinc calibration is suppressed by 16%. In addition, the different internal standards are suppressed by different amounts. 6.2% for germanium, and are actually enhanced by 5% when scandium is used. So picking an internal standard can be critical in this case. Let's discuss how we can address these issues. If you can estimate the average concentration of the major cations in typical samples analyzed by your lab and build these levels into your calibration curves, you will see better results, less QC failures. So if you look at the calibration scheme we use in our drinking water application note for the Nexian 2000, 
you see that we are building in increasing levels of the major cations into our calibration curves with our trace elements. We do this by making up a more concentrated matrix stock with minerals, let's say five times the highest target concentration for these elements, and we spike it in in increasing levels uh, into each calibration standard. Make sure that these mineral standards are from an ultra pure stock solution. Doing this will help ensure that the calibration matrix is matched as close as possible to the samples, therefore providing more consistent and robust data. Now I would like to touch a bit on a few tricks within our software that could help be useful to you. Many labs will try to tune their ICPMS and cannot understand why any tuning they do is not working. It can be lots of reasons, but when we are unable to determine what changes caused these issues, my starting point for them is to go back to the last time their instrument was running well and reload their conditions from their default data set. Once this is done and saved, start a smart tune. In many instances, this can resolve their tuning issues for many customers. The same approach can work for the mass cal or dual detector calibration as well. Another software feature that may be helpful to many users is the help function. In my slide, you can see that the smart tune window is live. I can now click F1 and the help screen that applies to this particular window is now shown. This makes it much easier than trying to produce the correct terminology to find what you were looking for through the index feature. This option works on any screen within Synjustics. Another great tip for users is the diagnostic readback within the Synjustic software. On this page, you can right click on the temperature or voltage readback and a box will appear, similar to what I've shown in this slide. In this example, we are looking at the coolant temperature readback. This box will show the normal ranges for the parameter you are looking at. In this case, 10 to 35 degrees C is the acceptable range for this parameter. When your lab is having issues, you can see through this diagnostic feature where the problem may stem. This will help you and service develop a plan on how to address your instrument or facility repairs. Just to review, don't forget about Total Quant and the power that it can provide for your lab. Extended dynamic range should be a tool that labs analyzing high PPM levels of minerals should use to reduce dilutions, but still see trace elements to the low levels needed. Arsenic and selenium need all the help we can provide, and monitoring Krypton, as well as adding a little organic to your internal standards will go a long way to confirm your argon is clean that you were able to get to the detection limits needed for your analysis. Track your blanks for all matrices that you are analyzing. Know your acids and the blank levels typically seen in all your matrices. Determine the levels of minerals in your samples and match this into your calibration standards to produce a robust method. Remember that if your conditions are not working now, you can easily recall a good tune as a starting point. Use help. I still find things that are helpful about the software utilizing this feature. And don't forget about diagnostics. This can be a great way to help you and service determine any instrument or facility issues your lab may be having. Thank you for joining today. Please feel free to reach out with any questions you may have. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sandy, and um, and to thank everyone else for attending. I just uh, guess we'll get to our uh, Q and A session. Um, uh, as always, uh, just post uh, any additional questions or comments or other things that we could talk about. Uh, anything that you know, any ideas or something that came to your mind, inspired you from. Sandy's uh, talk today. That'd be great. And I'll, and I'll start, Sandy and I'll start going through it here. Hey, Sandy, just want to make sure you're 
there? I, I am yeah. here. Okay. <laughs> Were you, then I didn't lose you or anything. All right. So let's start. I'm going to go to the beginning of the list here. Um, I'm just a few here. This one's a long one. Yeah, it's quite a, uh, a detailed one. Uh, they're asking how to increase counts uh, using nebulizer, gas auxiliary, et cetera. Um, in general, uh, you know, I can answer that. In general, we, you know, the, the counts are related to how much is going into the plasma. So it, it depends on, on the system, how it's set up and, and so forth. So there's a lot of, a lot of variables there. Um, so you may want to reach out to your application scientist to, to get into the specifics of how your system is set up. Um, next question, is, is there some sort of brochure or documentation on how to perform total quant and how it works? So I can take that, Aaron. Yeah, yes. so yes, there is um, some information that I can share with you all. Uh, it goes through how to do a total quant, which is really what we would term semi-quant analysis. Um, you know, usually labs use this as a great tool for screening or determining dilutions or uh, especially with unknowns. A lot of people like it. Once you fine-tune total quant, um, you can utilize it to quantify numbers too. My lab used to do this many times. But there is information out there, really, and it's more about getting the fingerprint on uh, what's in your samples, and it can show you that. Um, it's a great feature that I think a lot of labs don't utilize as much as they could. Yeah, that actually leads. There's another question uh, that was similar that uh, said, "We have a Nexen 1000. What does total quant mean?" I, I guess they they have a Nexen 1000, but they've never used total quant. So that leads into this. Yeah. Total quant is a, is a semi-quantitative analysis, um, typically using one blank and one one standard um, for um, as many elements on the periodic table as possible. Then, uh, essentially, based on the response of one element, it could estimate the concentration of another, even if it isn't calibrated for, just based on how a mass spec would, in theory, you know, respond to a particular mass and analyte and how it ionizes in the plasma, we call the response curve. So yeah, um, there is some instruction on how to do that. Of course, in, in our training courses, we provide instruction on how to do that on in our software as well. Um, so that if you really want to get down to it and practice it in a virtual environment, we now offer some virtual training around that. Um, and Sandy, you, you do have a, a a bit of a guide, right, on how to do it. So we, could, we yes. could provide that as well. Yeah, it's a good idea. Probably should have added it as a handout. Um, just remember, there mind out there are a few handouts available uh, for download if needed. Um, I had a question from somebody. Can we get the slides? Yeah, as always, um, we provide the you know the the slides. The copy of this presentation can be. Uh, accessed uh, via the, the follow-up link, and it's always there for, for viewing. Um, all right, so next one. Adding minerals to standards. Same technique for analyzing salt, so for like iron salt, zinc salts, for other trace elements. Yes, so you could do that. I think that the key thing is, as Aaron kind of mentioned earlier on the first question, is making sure that your system is set up properly to handle uh, what you're introducing. So that you have the correct nebulizer, um, even utilizing other techniques that I have not talked about. There are a few. Um, I talked about EDR quite a bit, but you could also use what we call AMS, which is all matrix solution, where you can do a dilution of your aerosol before it reaches the plasma as well. That's another way to do it. 
some labs, especially uh, labs Nutra or food or something like that, where they know they have really elevated minerals or iron or zinc, as you're talking about, that's another great feature that you can utilize as well that will help. Yeah, 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 no, that's a good point. Uh, um, and that actually leads to another question, very similar, I think, uh, the response is, you know, we're a food lab, and then uh, there, there have many saturations for potassium, sometimes other elements. Do you recommend EDR or what else? Yeah, so again, a little bit the same. So dilution, yes, you can, you know, a lot of times dilution yeah. is the way, but yeah, um, it depends on what those levels are. And again, reach out to your FAS for your lab. They can kind of walk you through the sample intro, how to set up your method, if EDR is the only way, or if there are other things too. It kind of depends on the trace elements in the analysis you're trying to do. Uh, and also if AMS is another option, that would be viable as well. Yeah, that you know, that's what, uh, yeah, because AMS is our all matrix solution, it's uh, aerosol dilution technique, and it, what I, I call, I like to call it, you know, unspecific dilution, whereas EDR is a specific dilution. It specifically right. dilutes a particular mass, renal. Um, right. So if you, if you had, you know, for the example, these food samples, which are typically high in potassium, you know, high potassium all the time, quite regularly, and potassium ionizes very readily, like sodium, potassium, et cetera. Um, I always employ EDR on, on sodium and potassium if I'm looking for them. Uh, by ICFS, just to protect my detector, <laughs> just so less ions hit the detector, um, you know, and, uh, and and saves it from getting that that extra uh, ion impact, and, and, so, and reduces saturation and extends my linear range and so forth. Um, yeah, so that's that's a good point. Um, so looking at how the system's set up, what dilutions you're doing, both a liquid and or aerosol, and then uh, using EDR. Another thing is you can use collision gas as well. That kind of does knock down the signal a little bit. But again, it, it depends where, where the problem is. is it, if it's in the plasma or in the mass spectrometer. Um, and then next question, do you have any experience using rubidium as an internal standard? That's a good question. I it typically is. have not used rubidium. I don't know if Aaron has. Uh, I've never used rubidium as an internal standard. I mean, it ionizes fairly readily. Uh, I guess it could be. Um, not really. I mean, the, my issue would be what strontium interference on that. Yeah. Um, uh, that is clean isotope. But yeah, I don't. I, I've never actually used that one as an internal standard. No. Uh, oh, Sometimes maybe the typing was incorrect, but sometimes rhodium is, is, is a, you know, a common yes. health standard. Um, yeah. I sometimes like rhodium over yttrium in a lot of cases, but it depends yeah. upon the matrix. So. Depends on the matrix. Like rhodium, I never use it, and I rarely use it in a high copper matrix, for right. example, because there's a, a copper interference on it, right? But um, right. But in general use, it's pretty. Oh, good. Um, and then next question. I have, I have observed uh, not proper drainage in the waistline. What, what might be causing it? Um, sometimes you'll have a kink. I see this a lot in my mass spec where I've gotten a kink in the line. You know, sometimes you can do wetting as well, where, you know, if if you've had droplet buildup and then you have any kind of um, waste that's kind of hanging on to your drain solution as it comes out, you'll see that. I personally try to fix that because I like to have the visual of what someone had trained me once always called ants marching. That was his terminology. Uh, so I like to see that if at all possible, but again, that may be more to do with your matrices and making sure that your spray chamber is not hanging on to things and um, then getting into your drain. 
Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. So there's different. Like, is it actually pumping out? Yes. Is, is the issue, or is it like physically kind of coming off the sides of the chamber and down into the drain? Is that the issue? So is there, uh, you know, those those are kind of two different um, issues. Right. And most of the time, if it's just it's not pumping, replace your pump tubing, replace all your transfer lines. Maybe there's a blockage, right? Um, if it's the wetting characteristics of the chamber, then clean it. Uh, pull it off and give it a good soaking, right? Clean it. Right. Um, I had a question here. Uh, do you have smart tune feature synergistics for AA? <laughs> no, no, not really. I mean, AA is a little more simplistic um, than you know optimizing it than than ICPMS. So uh, there, although there are gas optimization, uh, auto optimization features. Uh, in the system on the Pinnacle 500 and 900, and then the 900 has flame position optimization as well. Um, but uh, that's really all that needed in flame uh, for the most part. Um, next question is, why does sonication not work for glass nebulizers? <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, it's funny because uh, there's so many people that do this and don't understand that they're damaging their neb. Uh, you know, it's not, it's the way it's prepared, the way it's made, basically, uh, it is going to damage if you sonicate it, whether it's quartz or glass. Uh, you know, you can back, there's quite a few options on cleaning um, nebulizers. We have, I'm not sure how to say it, uh, the Elio, where you can, back flush or Iluo, Iluo, Iluo. Iluo, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's other ways as well. I know if you have a PFA nub, um, ESI can help too if you do have a blockage. We used to have other ways to clean things, but Yeah. You know, I mean for the PFA they use few silica lines. Yep. Yep. Uh, to, uh, you, you know, you don't probably want to do that on a on a glass, right? <laughs> You'll probably yeah. Uh, break it, but you can back flush glass. So the glass, yep. yeah, that's yep. that's what I use. Yeah. Yep. Um, and most of the time, but... I think you can kind of make your own. Um, you know, if you've got enough tools in the lab, you can kind of set up a system that's similar. Right. To... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, the little um, is kind of nice. It kind of locks in the, the nub yes. in there. And... Then you won't damage it. I mean, a lot of people they'll drop it. I mean, it's the same thing with cones or anything. You know, if you drop things or jar things you are going to damage it so yeah. <laughs> you know you got to be careful i always said that in the lab that the the cone always lands on the tip and <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um, exactly i had a good question I, I, you know for someone um how accurate is edr compared with offline dilution of samples well, that's a good question. I haven't done a research project on that, but that's uh, that's actually a good uh, question. Well, it's kind of different. Like I've done some, and yeah, it, it, and it's different. I mean, the, yeah. I mean, accuracy I've seen is improved. You know, but you know, very similar. Um, right. But it's it's a it's a difficult question because so if the inaccuracy is due to it you know, it having a, a high matrix, right? And causing a lot of issues in the nebulization or, right. or and then in the plasma and the atomization ionization processes, right? Then that's a different thing, right? So sometimes a liquid dilution and or an aerosol dilution will improve that. Right. And, and your accuracy will improve. EDR is just an electronic attenuation. So right. it, it works as long as, everything else is working before it, yeah. right? As long yeah. as it's nebulizing, as long as it's ionizing. Um, so I've found it, 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 the accuracy is fine uh, as long as you've addressed any of the other issues, like your matrix. Ma yeah, like if your matrix matching and all that sort of stuff, right? right. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, it's as accurate kind of as everything that comes before it. Yep. Um, does does adding IPA or methanol boost arsenic signals also work with DRC mode on the LNDRC? Yeah. Well, yes. 
Yeah. What are your thoughts there, Sandy? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, adding any, you know, sorts of carbon, um, yeah. you know, enhances um, those. It just needs like, to be consistent is yeah. the, the key there. Yep. Yeah. The key is consistency. I agree. Um, another question. What does EDR mean? Thanks. Extended dynamic range. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that we're able to extend that. Extended dynamic range. Yeah. Um, extend your your linear or your working range kind of for for the for the detector so it doesn't right. saturate uh, as easily for a particular mass. There's you know there's many people um, that if they have the correct front end set up they can do as I said in the talk I think you can do much much higher than you think typically on an ICPMS you know many times in my experience. I would have run those samples by ICP OAS for the minerals at 100 ppm or something, uh, but they are able to utilize that EDR and get it all in one run from ICP MS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And um, so, I, actually, kind of a question I had regarding that was when you analyze these high levels, like I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm reading between the lines or I'm adding words to this question. But when you analyze magnesium sodium or magnesium calcium, do you use an ionization suppressor? So are they thinking like for AA or something? I, I think or they maybe? need, I think they uh, are thinking like ICP OES and AA where we use like an ionization buffer. Yeah. It's actually more of a buffer that they're called. They're, they're too, too, control the number of electrons in the plasma like buffer that uh yeah. right the ionization that's happening in the plasma um do we do you use it ice press? usually not right, right? uh yeah. oes and aa yeah because they're more tolerant remember in an icp mass spectrometer compared to an optical emission or a8 where we're, we're looking at kind of the light um, in, in a mass spectrometer, we actually have to physically sample what's in the plasma or what's going into the plasma and bring those ions into the mass spectrometer. So we, in effect, we want to reduce some of that stuff that's going into the plasma. So there's, you know, an adequate number of, of ions uh, going in. So really, I mean, just pump less sample in and reduce the amount that you're putting in the plasma and then matrix match just kind of right. in yep. general. The matrix match is the big thing too. Yeah, yeah, we don't 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 generally use ionization suppressor. And another thing for for um for mass spec, it, they're usually contaminated, yeah. <laughs> and so we don't, you know, they're just going to contaminate things more. It's going to be more of a mess. Um. So then another question: When what is the best way to perform a mass calibration? And when should, during the check, daily check, should this occur? It's a good question. So repeat that one more time. What was the beginning? No. I didn't hear the beginning. Yeah. So what is, the what is the best way to perform a mass calibration? And then the second part is, and when? When should, when should this be done, I'm guessing? What's the best way and when should it be done? So first and foremost, you have to know that your system is uh, operating properly before you do a mass cow. Uh, I've seen lots of labs where they just have it go through, you know, as their full tune and smart tune, and there was an issue, say the wrong solutions being introduced or whatever, um, and that ends up causing big issues. And that's kind of one of the things I talked about previously, where it's like reload your your good conditions because sometimes you know, people aren't doing them individually. And then what happens is they have something that failed and they didn't notice and they just went on. So, you know, yeah. making sure that <laughs> you have a solution going in and the proper solution when you're ready to do that. Mm -hmm. I know there are people that, you know, they like to modify their mass cow and do, you know, particular, you know, we have a basic one that's in there. But a lot of people may want to look at all the lead masses or they may want to look at all the magnesium masses or, you know, we see that a lot here. Um, I'm out of Colorado and I see that a lot. So 
you know, all of that can be modified. But again, I would do it after you've done your normal daily parameters um, before you did that and make sure that those met before you do it. Exactly. I, I actually say it's not enough. It's not totally really to optimize the performance of the system. Really, just it's just tweaking it slightly. And in general, right. for the LAN and Xian series ice cream S, they're rarely yeah. needed. Um, <laughs> they're they're very rarely off. And and as Sandy said, most of the times people run it not understanding that and they mess the system up more because yeah. they yeah. now calibrated the thing on the wrong mass. So right. yeah, I avoid doing mass calibration. That's the last optimization <laughs> I do. And, and I know it, the instrument's rocking and rolling and ready to go. So I, yeah, I barely do that. Um, yeah. Kind of I know for drinking water, they sometimes require it. Um, yeah. You know, that you have true. to do it and we understand that. And, and again, that, in that case, you can do it. You can click peak width only. And it yeah. just plays a little bit with the resolution, but not the mass cal. Yeah. Right. So in that case for EPA, they wanted they're more worried about you know the resolution too, right? And so the, you click peak width only. You know. So uh, I'll do that. Um, we soaked our nebulizer in two percent nitric for cleaning. Uh, you said what solution? So I guess they're asking about the RBS solution. Oh, yeah. So basically, um, yeah, that's something that you can you can get. But I I personally like it just diluting that down and utilizing that um, the RBS twenty five. How much 25. do you dilute that? I usually do like a one or two percent um, myself. I don't know what you've used, Aaron, in the past, but yeah, you know you don't want it to be too concentrated. Um, no, it's pretty potent stuff, right? Yeah, so you can it is. dilute. Yeah. There's any of that you can use. I mean, it kind of depends on your system. My old lab, I used to use a dilute, like Micro 90 was another one that we got from other vendors um, that I like too. It's kind of a, a wetting agent that you just want to do a big dilution on for the most part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Making sure you don't, you know, it doesn't have, if you're doing phosphorus or, you know, you want to make sure that for some of that yeah, you need to look happen. closer. Yeah, you gotta you gotta just check. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes exactly. it, water's good. <laughs> well, a little even water and a little bit of nitric. Yep. Yeah. That's um, the best way first. But, yeah, yeah. If that works, then yeah, you know, that's cleanest. Um, next question: Is there a document related to salt water analysis for the next gen? Um, I mean, there are at some apps. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of details when you get into seawater analysis. Um, and uh, typically, uh, it's there's there's different methods, right? More from dilute and shoot to pre-concentration, um, um, and, and so forth. So it really depends what you know, analyte lists you're looking for. Um, but yeah, there we do have we do have some on the next in series. If you want to reach out, um, just kind of making through the. Okay, so so here's a question. We deal with biological specimens, so expect cations to be present present at similar concentrations, regardless of trace elements. So that makes sense. Yeah, the, the majors are going to be at, at similar concentrations. Can you comment on the calibrator matrix matching protocol versus using the standard edition pro? Um, um, I'm not sure. What do you mean compared to what I showed earlier? Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah. Uh, so you could do, you know, the, the one thing that's different from what I showed is it was not added to the lower calibrators, only mm -hmm. to the higher ones, basically to just help that calibration not be skewed more so. But again, if you know I have a particular, let's say it's sodium or magnesium or whatever, in every sample, it's going to be the same concentration. Yes, you could add that exact same one to all of your calibrators if you wanted mm -hmm. to matrix match. The, the key is to make sure that that's clean. Um, the addition that you make, because mass spec is so sensitive, we want to make sure that we're not introducing more error 
um, when you're yeah, when you're it's always that. it's always a game, right? Always a balance between trying to make matrix match some of those majors as 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 best as possible, but then avoiding interferences and contamination. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. and not being too high. Your system, again, has to be set up properly. Uh, you know, you, I wouldn't want you to put a percent magnesium in every standard and say, oh, this is going to work right. You know, you want to make sure that you're trying to marry everything, um, whether it's all the things we've talked about, whether that's EDR, whether that's a matrix match or um, AMS or something like that. Hopefully, that I had, a, had a, another recent uh, question. Um, if we're running different sample types, do we need different optimizations? It's not a bad question. Uh, in general, not. I mean, you uh, you you could. It depends if you're really trying to dial in. Like if you're doing ultra trace versus ultra dirty, um, you may optimize, have different pump settings and, and liquid flow rates, right? That may change. Uh, you could use different aerosol solution settings, different AMS settings, you could use the EDR, but that's more on, on, on the method. How, you know, optimize, yeah, the only thing, really the big thing, if you're gonna switch a lot between, it could be a different sample and production system, right? Uh, especially if you're going from dirty to clean. Um, and uh, so, Really, the big difference usually is some of the some of the maybe the nebulizer or oxide optimizations may change um, for different methods. So you may want to you may have more oxide tolerances or less oxide tolerances in some methods, uh, depending on you know what's in there. Um, so yeah, you you could uh, in general in a high production laboratory <laughs> we avoid it and try to make a compromise method. Uh, and then next question, how many internal standards can be used in one run? Can we use one and match it to all masses? It's not recommended. <laughs> you can. <laughs> you can, right? It's, we're not stopping you from doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, typically, most people, if you were doing a full scan, let's say, across low, mid, high mass, at minimum, most people would say use three. A lot of people use many more than that. And it kind of depends. You want to match close mass, ionization potential. If there's interferences, you may have to steer clear of some, like we talked about earlier with the rhodium, yttrium, um, some of those. So you can, it kind of depends upon your, your matrix again as well. But I wouldn't recommend using only one. I have done that in the past for mm -hmm. certain things, but we don't recommend it if yeah, you can get around it. It depends. It also depends on what masses are in your method. If you have very limited masses, yeah. right, you could easily yes. get away with it, right? Yes, yeah, yes, so. yes, yes. There's yeah. not, nothing limiting you. It's just a matter of the if you're following a particular method or such. Exactly. Um, Someone asked, what's the difference between EDR and cross calibration of the detector? Uh, the, which range should be used for each? Um, well, they're kind of totally different things. The uh, cross calibration the detector is the detector optimization, how that detector operates in response to incoming ion beam, or ion, you know, how it responds to a particular um, mass to charge ratio. Um, the EDR is simply, it's it's pretty simple. It just reduces the amount of ions in the ion beam transiting into your analyzer quadruple, right? So the quadruple prior to the detector. So it uh, essentially just reduces the ions. So it, it extends your working range. Um, someone asked, would you recommend um, germanium 74 instead of germanium 72 as an internal standard? I haven't used that. Um, I don't believe in recent days. Have you, Aaron? 74? In, in, in general, I use 72. Um, I do too. Off the top of my head, my brain isn't telling me why, but there are valid reasons. Um, there, are valid, there are valid reasons. I believe it, it, it's a spectral interference rate. It's an overlap yeah. on 74 with, what is it, selenium? Um, but yeah, but yeah, I, I, I avoid 74 completely and I go to 72. It's, yeah. it's just cleaner, cleaner math. Um, uh, 
We're almost to the top of the hour, so I wanted to kind of grab some. Um, oh, what percent of TDS can AMS tolerate? Um, that's a really good question. Um, so, of course, as Sandy said, the nebulizer needs to be selected appropriately, and your liquid flow rates need to be appropriate. Um, but if you are pumping in high TDS, like in the percent levels, uh, our a the AMS we can we can employ you know up to you know 200x dilution. So that that what that translates into is in in general in ICMS the rule of thumb is you want 0.2% TDS hitting the plasma, or 0.1 or 0.2%. Again, that depends on transport efficiency and other ICP specific parameters, but in general, you want kind of around that hitting your plasma uh, on a you know five to ten percent transport efficient uh, system. So, what that translates into it at two hundred x is you know you're in the uh, thirty odd percent. Now that's a really high TDS solution, <laughs> and not many things will stay in solution at that. But it'll be just like a saturated brine solution. You you can get in there. Um, uh, definitely, uh, but again, they're at a very high dilution, so you're diluting it 200x. Um, so there's pros and cons of doing so, right? Is that and and will the nebulizer handle it? Uh, we recommend at those higher TDS to use a argon humidifier, um, so you don't get salty notes as well. So um, so yeah, it, it can tolerate. It, it you know the plasma can only take so much, so AMS can help it reduce what's going into it up to 200x sort of dilution yep um let me see we got one more time for one more question uh try and get uh, one more oh So this question I get a lot. I have a lot of memory effects with antimony, tin, molybdenum, even with very clean samples. What do you recommend? Yeah, those are those are always going to be trouble. I, I personally like to keep concentrations as low as possible. Um, I don't know what Aaron's felt like, but you know, usually yeah. it's more a matrix issue, but also trying to analyze too high a lot of times and then it just takes forever i mean if you if you look at some studies that have been done for all of those silver antimony tin they you don't need much uh, you know some people even over 20 ppb calibrations will see 10 15 minute rinse out so it's more a matter of picking the proper matrix as well as trying to keep your concentrations at the lower end if at all possible. And then if it, once it's hung up, you got to clean it out, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. If, it, it. if it's really gunked up and it's having a lot of carryover, it, kind of what Sandy said, one of the best things to do is keep your system clean, keep all your transfer mm -hmm. lines. So everything from the auto sampler probe all the way to yeah. the pump tubing, to the transfer lines, all the connections. The nebulizer in the spray chamber. Anything that the liquid touches is usually where a lot of this carryover is happening. Now, if you have really high levels, uh, it's going to happen regardless how clean your system is. Right. But keeping your system clean, regular maintenance, regular replacement of those things uh, uh, will help. Obviously, there are other acids or reagents like HF that can help in some cases. Um, but we try and avoid HF, especially if we're using glass components, right? So, you know, there's there's some considerations there. Unfortunately, <laughs> I am out of time, and uh, we hit the top of the hour a little bit past. Um, yeah, please feel free to reach out to Sandy or I, you know, if a, a, any additional questions. And uh, thanks to Chewy for the great picture here, right? <laughs> yeah, I like that picture there. Uh, so yeah, so feel free to reach out to Sandy and I, and we can, you know, um, help you if the answer's easy and quick, or, or we can help connect you with your uh, local field application scientist. 
um, if, if you're not working with them already. Um, and to locate all the webinars and on all the on-demand and et cetera, uh, you can visit this link and, and you'll get a copy of that uh, link um, to you in your, your email. You know, I'm sure you already have it. Um, and so, yeah, thanks, Sandy, again, and uh, thank everyone for attending today's webinar on Ice Cream S Tips and Tricks. If you have any other questions, as I said, reach out. Uh, once you leave today's webinar, there'll be a survey on the presentation. We would appreciate it if you complete that, provide feedback, uh, you know, what we could uh, add in next time. We'll, we, we like to continually do these. And then you'll receive a follow-up email within about 24 hours with a link to the recording. So on behalf of Perkin Elmer and uh, our presenter, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day, week. Take care.